The hiddenness of God. Why isn't God more obvious? This is not at all a new question. You can find it, of course, through history. And uh, we have a famous uh, quote from Bertrand Russell when he was asked uh, if there actually is a God and he will confront you when you die. How would you motivate your atheism? And Bertrand Russell said, not enough evidence, God. Not enough evidence. So God has not made himself enough uh, obvious. And this, this question has regained a, culture, a kind of new cultural life. At least in, in my setting in Sweden, it, become, it is much more common question and objection than it was uh, 20 years ago. And there's a lot of voices uh, raising it. Here are some, uh, not uh, uh, really current voices, but, but some famous voices raising the question. Carl Sagan, uh, the American cosmologist, uh, he asked the question, God could have engraved the Ten Commandments on the moon. It would be really easy for God to make himself obvious. Give us some sign that would impress us. Or he could have had a hundred kilometer crucifix in the Earth's orbit. So just circling the Earth, a gigantic cross, and we would see it every day. It's a constant reminder that he is actually there. But God has not done that. Uh, he could have engraved in the, in the uh, cell made by... It's there. It's there, yeah. <laughs> he could have engraved made by God. But obviously he has not done that. I'm a, a Woody Allen fan. Uh, not admiring all aspects of his personal life, but really enjoying a lot of his movies. And in one of the movies, it's actually uh, three short stories, the New York stories. Uh, there, one of the stories is called uh, Oedipus. And uh, Woody Allen plays a neurotic uh, man, and he has a very complicated relationship to his mother. And his mother nags him and complains and criticizes him. It, she's just such a pain for, for uh, the character Woody Allen plays. And finally she dies. What a relief for <laughs> Woody Allen. So he's really re rejoicing. His mother dies. The following day, when he comes out of his house, he sees a gigantic face on the sky of Manhattan. And it's his mother talking to him from the sky and continuing all, his, uh, all her criticism against him. You shouldn't do that. Oh, you are worthless. Why do you do that? And the whole Manhattan is listening. So it's so embarrassing. And of course, God could have shown himself in this way. A Zeus-like face looking down from heaven, commenting on our everyday life. But he has not done that. This is actually a, um, uh, an image and philosopher uh, is taking in a, in a very well-known quote on the, the hiddenness of God. The philosopher, uh, uh, N.R. Hansen, he's saying this. And he's talking about why he does not believe in God. Suppose, however, that next Tuesday morning, just after breakfast, all of us in this world are knocked to our knees by a percussive and air-shattering thunderclap. Snow swirls, leaves drop from the trees, the earth heaves and buckles, building topple and tower tumble. The sky is ablaze with an airy, silvery, silvery light. Just then, as all the people of this world look up, the heavens open, the clouds pull apart, revealing an unbelievable, immense, and radiant-like Zeus figure, towering above us like hundred Everests. He frowned darkly as lightning plays across the feature of his Michelangeloid face. He then points down at me and explains for every man and child to hear, I have had quite enough of your too clever logic shopping and word watching in matters of theology. Be assured. N.R. 
Hansen that I most certainly do exist. If God would do that, I would believe, he continues. But God, God is not doing that. He's not making himself unavoidably obvious. So I do not have any really good reasons to believe in him. Of course, Nietzsche is the one who has formulated it most cynical and um, sharply. A God who is all-knowing and all-powerful and who does not even make sure his creature understand his intention. Could that be a God of goodness? All religions exhibit traces of the fact that they owe their origin to an early immature intellectuality in man. They all take astonishingly lightly the duty to tell the truth. They as yet know nothing of a duty of God to be truthful towards mankind and clear in the manner of his communications. So there is a duty God have that he has not fulfilled, and for Nietzsche, because he's not there. But of course a God would understand the duty to communicate clearly and convincingly, I'm here and I'm your creator. But God has not done that, so he's not there. This, uh, this problem is um, a version of the problem of evil, you can say, uh, in terms of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, a good God, we can assume, wants to contact us. If you create someone, it's, you can assume that that kind of God would contact you if it's a good God. A good God could contact us. Well, what's the problem? He could contact us in an undisputable way so that no one would deny his existence. It's a piece of cake for God to show up in a way no one can deny. The fact that God has not showed up in such a way, in an undeniable way, indicate that a good God does not exist. So it's a kind of a version of the problem of evil. And when you start to think about it, it, uh, it has some power. It really starts you to think of all the ways God could have used to communicate, which he obviously has not made use of. And for the Christian, the problem has, there, there is an added dimension that God is not obviously uh, visible or knowable uh, now, but we look forward to a day we w when we will see face to face. Why not now? There will be a day when God will manifest himself in an undeniable and deeply personal way, so Paul can talk about we will see face to face. So, by hiding himself now, God seems to contribute to unbelief, which is a sin. So the, the, the problem becomes bigger for the Christian. A lot of people say, I would believe if God were more visible. But they stay in unbelief, so they, and that's a big sin. And it seems like God is contributing to that sin. Okay, so, <clears throat> so much for the problem, trying to identify uh, the problem. What is the solution? Now, I will do something I uh, nearly never do. Usually, making a presentation, you identify the problem, and then you take a number of arguments, pointing in, in a certain direction, and at the end, you draw the conclusion and show, by these arguments, I have solved this problem. But of course, you, you wait with the solution till the, to the end of the lecture. You don't spoil your presentation by giving the answer on beforehand, looking in a... Um, Lucas, I have a faucet for Engelska. I'm looking for an English word. Uh, 
Yeah, you are not giving the right answer on beforehand. But this time I will give you the answer now. And I hope you will not fall asleep when I then will try to motivate and explain the answer. So, why is God dealing with us in this way? And the really short answer is this. God wouldn't win anything by being more obvious. God's purposes for his creation and for us wouldn't be better fulfilled by making him more obvious than he has chosen to make him. Why is that? <clears throat> it, it is all about us needing to think right about God. We need to understand who God is in order to see that he wouldn't benefit from making himself more obvious in terms of his purposes. And we must look at the right places where he actually had made himself visible. So now let me try to unpack this claim and to see if it, if it hold, holds water, if it's a, if it's a true claim. <clears throat> and then we need to get rid of some misconceptions and misunderstandings, and, and we need to do some thinking about a number of areas to see why this is so. So, the first is our concept of God. The concept of God. Uh, I meet too many uh, people who have a very childish concept of God, non-Christian thinking that the Christian belief about God is like uh, the, uh, the old polytheistic beliefs of Zeus and, and, and all the gods um, meeting on uh, Mount Olympus. Thinking of God basically as a, as a physical uh, being and saying, well, science has not uh, find God, he's not there. Uh, as if God were an object that we could find within space and time. So our first point here is that, of course, what the Christian faith is claiming is that there is a transcendent God outside time and space. He's not an object within time and space, and we do not expect to find him uh, hiding behind the planet or, or being somewhere in, in the physical realm, so we could suddenly, oh, here is God. So he's a transcendent uh, God. So we, we must have the right expectations uh, of who God is. So God, his transcendence, it means he's very different from uh, everything else we uh, have been in contact with. And the New Testament is very clear. God, who alone has immortality, who dwells in an uh, unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. And the Gospel of John is clear. No one has ever seen God. So we ourselves affirm you cannot see God, and he's not an object you can approach like we approach physical objects. Now, of course, he could still give undeniable signs of himself. So I've not to answer that question, but we need to think right of God. He's a transcendent, spiritual, eternal being. Secondly, the character of God. God is different, not only in being transcendent, he is different also in being holy. Uh, and this is said many, 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 many more times than that God is love, for example. God's holiness is one of the key concepts of who God is. Holy, holy, holy in the book of Isaiah. Or we can read in the book of, of Revelation. Which, among uh, several things, means that he is totally separated from evil. He is totally separated from evil. So the New Testament can say, our God is a consuming fire, and he cannot coexist with evil. Uh, th there will be a confrontation. So God is different. He's transcendent. He is an absolutely holy God. Originally, the Christian faith says that God manifested himself 
on earth for the first human beings and walked in the garden and had a close relationship and they did not deny his existence. We don't know the exact manifestations, but the existence of God was not the problem. He was, for them, obvious. Their problem became later on something else. They rebelled against God. And our belief is that we as human beings are not in our original state. So from the beginning, a close relationship with obvious manifestations of God. But now we are separated from God because of our sin. And because God is holy and a consuming fire. And therefore God can say to Moses, very unique person, the person of Moses, you cannot see my face. For no one may see me and live. And here's things that are really challenging, the attitudes of those people I was quoting from the beginning, and, and challenging uh, a lot of students who are coming to me with this question. Why is God not, not making himself more obvious? I, I demand, if, to believe in God, I, I demand of him to, to, to come closer. Uh, and I think we need to change attitude here or help people to see that there's something wrong in that attitude. If God seems far away, who do you think has moved away? And the Christian answer is, of course, the first step was taken by us. We removed ourselves, so to speak, from, from God by rebelling. And if we now ask, why is not God making himself obvious? We do not fully understand what we are asking for. If God would go all in and confront us, what do you think would happen? This is what we call Judgment Day. So I'm not sure people understand fully what they're asking for. You really want God to confront us? <coughs> so the key point here, we need to do some, some good thinking about God, his transcendence, his holiness, and our broken relationship to him. Thirdly, and this is a key point, the re revelation of God through reality. The revelation of God through reality. Now, if there is a per personal creator God, I agree with the statement that I think he would make himself known. I'm not saying I can demand it of God because a, a creature cannot demand anything of God, but I would say it's very natural to think that a personal creator God, creating personal beings filled with questions about the ultimate, it would be a very strange thing if he chose not to relate to us. Like it's a very strange thing if two human beings are the cause of the origin to a, a child and they would choose not to relate to their child. Something is wrong if you give life to a personal being and you do not relate to it. So I, I would expect, even if I cannot demand, that God would somehow relate to us if he's there. So my question is not if we can assume that God will show up, but the question is, can we re really know how God must show up? And all those quotes assume that God must give us some stupid physical sign in terms of an inscription or moon or a, a cross or a face on the, in, in the sky. But that is really pretentious to say, if God showed up in this way, then I would believe. And then just ne neglect the 1,000 other possibilities that are at God's hand. And if he is God and we is his create creatures, we need to be open for God to choose the ways he contact us, contacts us. So we must look at the right places. We must have a kind of curiosity, not demand this sign, kind of sign, but the more, be more open-minded. Has he shown himself anywhere? To be curious, are there some signs of God? So we must be open to look at the right place, and we cannot determine on beforehand what is the right place. We need to look for it. Like if you fall in love, you cannot demand, if I not talk as a man, how the girl should show how, uh, if she's interested. You need to be open. There are thousands of ways to show your interest for a person. 
and to demand only this and no other way. It's just stupid. As Christians, we believe that God has sh uh, shown himself through reality. But as we know from many examples, uh, you need to be open to interpret reality. And here is a picture, and, uh, and I guess a lot of you can see that that picture can be interpreted in two different ways. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a duck or it's a rabbit, just to help those of you who have a problem to see the, uh, both of them. So then, then you need to be, when you look at a picture like this, you need to be open to really study it and look at it from different angels to see, is there really a rabbit? Are you sure there is a rabbit? And not dismiss the picture immediately. You're stupid, there's no rabbit. It's only a duck, and then move on. You need to contemplate what you are standing in front of. And then suddenly, you, maybe you can start to see something you didn't saw immediately. This is the point that C.S. Lewis is making in, in his book, Miracles. And uh, he takes uh, uh, three different examples of, if you are in a house and look out in a garden, you can miss the window that you are actually looking through the window. Or if you're reading a book, you're so concerned with the content of the book that you lose the insight that you're reading with your eyes. So you're not thinking about your eyes, but about the book. Or when you speak, you're not conscious of the grammar you are actually using, or in my case, misusing, because you are just trying to use the language. And he says, in all these instances, all these instances show that the fact which, uh, which is in one respect the most obvious and primary fact, and through which alone you have access to all the other facts, may be precisely the one that is most easily forgotten. Forgotten not because it is so remote or abstruse, but because it is so near and so obvious. And that is exactly how the supernatural has been forgotten. And our belief is that reality actually uh, points towards God or bears his signature. But of course you can ignore it, like you ignore the window when you're describing the, uh, uh, the garden. Why is God hiding? We would say, well, he's not. He has revealed himself through reality. Maybe not in the way you demand, but he has chosen other ways. But he, there is a revelation from God. He has shown himself indirect through reality. And we would point to different aspects and how to best explain. And I will not go into this, but uh, uh, we would, of course, use the, the classical uh, or, or, or the big apologetic arguments for how to best explain this reality. Don't you see that here is an aspect you have forgotten, which makes it possible to understand this world. So we would, we would point to the experience of transcendence or the existence of the universe or the design of the universe or the human beings with our freedom uh, and our dignity and, uh, and value. We would point to objective moral values and, and so on and say God has give, given us uh, signals about himself. So God is not hidden. He has revealed himself. He has given good and sufficient reason, not exhaustive, but good and sufficient evidence. And it's a lot to, has to do with being open to look at the right place. And we would go on and say, God is not hidden. He has revealed himself in history, not only in reality, but in history. He has revealed himself personally not indirect, but personally, in history, in Jesus Christ. Of course, working within the, the people of Israel and then fulfilling all his pr uh, promises in Jesus of Nazareth, stepping himself into our reality. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So God is not hiding. He has revealed himself in Jesus. And we need to be open to 
study the Gospels and put ourselves in contact with the historical person of Jesus. So God is not hidden. He has showed up on earth. I love the, um, the formulation that you find twice in the book of Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, in the beginning of Luke, that he has visited his people. That is our belief. God is not hiding. He has personally visited the planet. Not in my country, not during my lifetime. But can I really demand that God must come to Sweden during the 20th century? Sounds like a stupid claim. I need to be open for God to choose the time and the place. And I have good access through the historical documents to the time and the place where he actually chose to show up. So we must look at the right place. And we would say the Gospels is really the right place if you're looking for God. Fifthly, God has shown himself through miracles. People often say, if I saw a miracle, then I would believe. And I believe God are doing miracles. Uh, if you will, will, um, will read something uh, scholarly, but at the same time very interesting, you should read Craig Keener's book on miracles, the credibility of the New Testament accounts. It's actually two volumes, one where he's discussing the New Testament, and the philosophical and historical questions on miracles, and then a second volume where he has gathered contemporary examples of God answering prayer in a mir miraculous way. And it's a very interesting and serious collection of testimonies about miracles in our time. Uh, this is a Swedish book, so if you learn Swedish, you can read a fantastic story uh, uh, about Elisa Lindqvist and how God healed her uh, and then has used her. So she's now a very public figure in Sweden. So miracle creates faith. That is obvious. And we can see in the Gospel of John that Jesus was doing miracles and people believed. Many believed because they saw what Jesus did. But here's the point. People are then asking why, if God showed me a miracle, then I would believe. It is not at all that simple. Miracles create faith within some people, but not automatically. So a lot of people came to believe in Jesus when he raised Lazarus from the death, but other people looking at the same miracle responded totally differently. So from that day on, the resurrection of Lazarus, they made plans to put Jesus to death. And not only Jesus, but Lazarus also. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. They wanted to get rid of the evidence of the miracle. So it's actually a false pretense to say, if I saw a miracle, then I would believe. That is not at all an automatic process. And you know, Jesus was doing a lot of miracles, uh, casting out demons. And then, of course, some people started to believe in Jesus. Others interpreted the miracle as the devil working through Jesus. And we need to be very honest about this. And I think some Christians uh, think wrongly here. If God would do a miracle, then nearly everyone would come to faith. Miracle creates faith, but we can't demand them. And Jesus is quite critical towards people who demand miracles and who do not want to look on a more broader scale. And he sometimes refuses to do miracles. What we as Christians would do is, of course, we would point to the grand miracle, the resurrection of Jesus. And even if God wouldn't do any more miracles today, if, we could still point to the grand miracle, of course, where God himself proved to all men that Jesus is the coming judge. So the resurrection is a proof enough in itself. We don't need more miracles in order to have reasons to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So, God is doing miracles today, I believe that, but God has already done the biggest miracle, the resurrection of Christ. 
And we need to point people to the right place. And that is actually the resurrection of Jesus. So, we need to think right about God. We need to look at the right places. Now, final point, the purpose of God. What is the purpose of God in dealing with us? It's obvious that God is not interested in give, giving generally a coercive clarity, give, making it just obvious for everyone that he actually exists. There is a certain de degree of ambivalence. You can interpret it, the miracles as the devil. You can interpret reality as self-explanatory and just ignore that God that it points towards God. So there is a certain degree of ambivalence. Why? Why is God in that sense hiding? It has to do with his purposes. And um, let me flatter the Danish here by quoting uh, their only famous philosopher, Søren Kierkegaard, and I had to admit we have no one that is famous in Sweden, so. Uh, uh, and uh, and it, the English title is Philosophical Fragments, and in Danish it's... <laughs> there, you, there you have the title in original. Philosophiska smuler in Swedish, Philosophical Fragments. As all great teachers, he tells a parable. And he has a parable about the king and the maiden. This wealthy, famous king with all his staff and all the people serving him and all the people admiring him and all the people wanting access to his resources or uh, uh, and, and uh, being close to the fame of the king and then he falls in love with a poor maiden and now the king has a big problem how should he know if she actually loves him if he show up there as there as a king he knows there's so many other factors coming into play. It would be socially fantastic travel upwards for the girl to be the queen. She will go from being a poor to a very rich person. She would go from being a nobody in society to being, being on the highest level. But would she actually care for the king? Would there be real love? How can he know? So he chooses not to approach the king, uh, the, the girl as a king, but he comes in anonymity as a poor, simple man to get to know the girl and to see if she is actually interested in him. And he uses that as a picture of how God approaches us, because God is interested not in us accepting his existence and then continuing our rebellion, but he's interested in us wanting to be close to him in a love relationship where we say yes to him because of who he is. To update the Søren Kierkegaard uh, parable, how do you think it was for Marilyn Monroe to try to date someone? Every normal dynamic is just totally weird for a person like Marilyn Monroe after she became famous. How could she ever know if a man really loved her or was just interested of her body? or the fame, or the whatever. Or think of, think of Bill Gates trying to date someone. I, I'm not trying here to destroy his marriage. I, I admire Bill Gates and Belinda and all they do in terms of charity. But, but just as an example, we know him as the richest man in the, world, in the world. All normal dynamics is just, it's just gone. And he knows that everyone he approaches uh, every woman, if, if he was uh, uh, single, immediately would think, oh, he's the richest man in the world. Wow. That is a future for me, regardless of who he, who he is as a person. 
God's purposes, and these are, of course, stupid examples, but still it can help us to, to, to think here. God's purposes are much more than to prove his, 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 his existence. The New Testament says that this is his eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We have a fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So this is about, do you really want to be united to, to obey, to belong to, to be formed by God? So everything changes when you think of the hiddenness of God. If God's goal is a real loving relationship. And notice, Jesus praises the Father actually for his hiddenness. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these two things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. So Jesus sees a wonderful secret here that this is a good way of dealing with men that in one aspect he is hiding himself but in another aspect he is revealing himself so that those who are interested and open and willing to obey God can find him. I love this quote from Solzhenitsyn. It is vain to affirm that which the heart does not confirm. There you have it. What's the meaning of saying, oh yes, now I see God exists? If your heart is not willing to affirm God as your creator, as your heavenly father, as your bridegroom, there is, it is vain to affirm that which the heart does not confirm. Blaise Pascal is uh, maybe the thinker who has written mo most about this, and he says it like this. God has willed to make himself quite recognizable by those, and thus willing to appear openly to those who seek him with all their heart, and to be hidden from those who flee from him with all their heart. He so regulates the knowledge of himself that he has given signs of himself visible to those who seek him, and not to those who seek him not. There is enough light for those who only desire to see and enough obscurity for those who have a contrary disposition. To formulate it in, uh, it in another way, God's revelation shows us who he is and simultaneously it makes us show who we are. God has revealed himself in such a way that his revelation will actually reveal us. 